Hi everyone, I'm Julian, your Biology 2600 Lab Instructor. Just a reminder that I am here to help in any way that I can. All you have to do is ask. This week we're going to be doing Lab 2, the Stream Survey at Bennett Road. We're going to start by orienting ourselves and taking a quick look at this entire location. So this is a large portion of Memorial University's St. John's campus. This is the Science Building and this is the new core science facility right here. So if we travel to Bennett Road in Portugal called St. Phillips, it will look like this. So this is Bennett Road. Uh, this right here is the stream that we're going to be looking at. So I'm going to stand on this bridge and look up this way to show you the riffle area right here. And I'm going to stand right here to show you the pool area which is located right here. Please read the lab 2 file and follow it along as you watch this video. Uh, keep in mind it is a video so you can pause and rewind at any time. And once you're finished, complete the partial lab report, which I'm going to discuss in detail at the end of this video, and upload it to the appropriate folder on Brightspace. So last week we looked at, um, took a general look at a variety of plant species and a variety of ecosystems. This week, we're going to look at a variety of animal species, specifically invertebrates, in two specific habitats, the pool and the riffle. The purpose is to observe how invertebrates are adapted to their environment, specifically how aquatic invertebrate composition varies in terms of body type in different environments, the riffle and the pool. Here we are on the bridge overlooking the riffle. A riffle is a rocky and shallow part of a stream with rough water. It can be created by a steep gradient or in narrow sections of the stream. The fast flowing water has two effects on the stream. It creates a rocky bottom as it washes debris and sediment downstream and as the ripples mix with the air they increase the oxygen concentration in the water. And here we are by the pool. A pool is a sediment rich and deep part of a stream with calm water. It can be created in flat areas or in water sections of the stream. The slow flowing water allows fine particulate matter to build up. Besides the water flow rate and its effect on the stream substrate, the amount of and variety of vegetation present on the banks also affects the stream environment. Banks with tall vegetation create a canopy that prevents sunlight from reaching the water. This limits the amount of aquatic vegetation, as there is little energy for photosynthesis, but supplies the stream with leaves and other coarse particulate organic matter, abbreviated CPOM, which is an invertebrate food source. Less sunlight also results in cooler water and a higher oxygen concentration as oxygen is more soluble in cooler water. Open banks with little or short vegetation allow more sunlight to reach the stream. This increases the amount of aquatic vegetation, sun provides energy for photosynthesis, which is a different invertebrate food source. More sunlight also results in warmer water and lower oxygen concentration. Oxygen is less soluble in warmer water. Wild factors discussed so far can combine in a variety of ways to create several different environmental conditions. For example, open riffles or canopy covered pools. The general trend is that riffles will have a vegetative cover while pools will be open. The invertebrate sampling, which your sample data is based on, has been done at the sites shown so far which meet this criteria. So 
So far we've looked at the different stream conditions created in the pool and the riffle. Next, we're going to talk about how inverts adapt to different stream conditions. We're going to start by looking at how inverts can be classified. Invertebrates can be organized taxonomically. However, looking at hundreds of taxa is a relatively non-informative method in terms of structures or adaptations. So, we will be classifying invertebrates according to functional feeding groups. These are shown here. In this approach, invertebrates are categorized based on morphological slash behavioral mechanisms of food acquisition and particle size of food ingested, rather than a specific food, as one mechanism can result in consuming a variety of food types. This approach establishes linkages to basic food resource categories listed in this column which require specific characteristics for their exploitation, listed in this column. Specific examples of invertebrates for each category are listed in the last column. Note that some invertebrate types are listed in several categories. This is because they use a variety of food acquisition methods. Additionally, keep in mind that invertebrates can adapt to specific environments. For example, caddisflies may use sand to make their protective case in riffles and mud in a pool. As we won't be in the field to observe representative invertebrates for each group, I will show you some images. Shredders wander the stream bottom looking for vegetation that has fallen in the water, such as leaf litter or other sea palm, including wood. Using their tearing mouth parts, they rip and shred the leaves as they feed. Gathering collectors primarily wander the stream bottom looking for F palm. This includes scavenging for dead organisms, detritus, or other food particles that get lodged between rocks or in deep pools. On the other hand, filtering collectors collect F palm from the water column using a variety of filters. Predators feed on other consumers. Grazers scrape algae and associated material off rocks and vegetation using rasping mouthparts. So I'm going to use this figure to tie together everything that we've discussed so far. So we looked at two stream environments, the riffle and the pool. Uh, the main thing separating uh, these two environments is the water velocity. So fast um, water flow in the riffle creates a rocky bottom and slow water flow in the pool allows sediment and debris to build up. On the outside are listed some of the invertebrate um, functional feeding groups that we discussed. So the idea of or the concept of the functional feeding groups supports the notion that certain linkages uh, exist in the stream between food type and invertebrate type. So, in the riffle you have overhanging vegetation. Um, as this falls into the river, it becomes a food source for invertebrates, so it is coarse particulate organic matter. And this is why we find shredders, uh, mainly shredders in this area. As the shredders eat the sea palm, they create smaller bits, um, almost to the point of F palm, and this is why you have collectors uh, found here as well, which eat the F palm in this area. As the C palm and F palm float downstream, um, they're either eaten by other invertebrates or they decompose. Either way, the result is you have more F palm created and F palm builds up in the pool. This is why you find filtering collectors in the pool, um, one of the major groups. The other major group is scrapers. The reason for this is um, there's no overhanging vegetation, which means you have lots of sunlight, and this allows aquatic vegetation to grow, which is the food source for the scrapers. So you can see, based on the environments in these two areas, you have uh, certain invertebrates certain invertebrate functional feeding groups attracted to these areas.
The last thing I'm going to do is show you the techniques that we use to obtain the sample data. So water depth, water velocity, and invertebrate sampling. I'm going to start by putting on my hip waders. And so once your hip waders are on, you use a small pan to get some water. And of course I'm going to do this in the pool because I don't want to slip on a rock and fall in the river, which will be pretty embarrassing. Next we're going to collect the rocks. Normally um, we'd collect a number of rocks, but because it's just me, today I'm going to just do one for demonstrative purposes. Um, and normally all of this would be split up uh, between a number of group members, but as it's just me, uh, the order is going to be slightly changed and you're going to see some multitasking. So. Once you find your favorite rock, the first thing you want to do is measure water depth and velocity. Uh, water depth is pretty straightforward. Use a meter stick to measure how deep it is. Velocity, you're going to take an object that floats, uh, put it next to your meter stick, and then time how long it takes to go from the beginning of your meter stick to the end of your meter stick. Alright, here we go. So I have my favorite rock right there. Measure water depth. And that's how you measure water velocity. up and you put it in your pan. So the first thing we're going to do is record the length and the width of the bottom of the rock. This allows us to calculate the area which we're going to record in our table and use it to measure to calculate density. Um, once you have that and you have it recorded you use a little tiny brush and essentially you start from one end of the rock, slowly brush, dip, brush, dip, and then um, that way you'll scrape off and brush off the invertebrates, and then you can identify them. So to identify them, you use a magnifying glass and a number of different guides, which I'm going to show you in dichotomous keys. And then we are going to record the invertebrate in our table uh, and use the area to calculate the density. We can classify the organisms in feeding functional group either by looking at the specific structures if you can make them out with the magnifying glass or based on how we identified slash classified it in our taxonomy we just research that type of organism and see how they eat or what they eat. So, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but we have a number of flatworms, so one right here. We have a crazy little guy right here who's not very happy at all. Uh, looks maybe like a mayfly larvae. Um, more flatworms. There's another little guy right here. So obviously you'd have to use a magnifying glass or a microscope to um, identify these organisms. And the last thing we do is put the rock exactly where we got it, and then we're done. So once you find your invertebrate, um, you would use identification keys or dichotomous keys to identify it. So I'm going to give you some examples of simple to more complex ones. Um, so this one would be relatively simple. You just have one picture, the name, um, and the size, and this would be the common name of course. So a more complicated version of this would be this here. So you have a number of pictures, um, you have a fair bit more information, you have actual order names here as well, and some example um, uh, classifications or families within that order. They can also be arranged into flowcharts that look like this. 
and these are broken up based on observable characteristics so shells um, no shells so everything here doesn't have a shell and essentially you follow this along until you find the organism that you're looking for um, another example of this would be this one in which they actually have questions and then you answer the questions um, and the answers allow you to work your way through and find your organism uh, so this is pretty similar to a dichotomous key which would look like this dichotomous keys have sets of two questions um, essentially the answer to one is yes and the answer to the other one is no so has segmented jointed legs does not have them and then it gives you um, a step to go to based on that and as you work your way through that you can eventually um, identify the organism so one really cool reference or source that I found is this one here so this is an interactive key so um, starts down here so let's say your organism has legs and then let's say it has 10 plus legs you click on that and it gives you a list of criteria of what it could be and then you can click on these for more information